So I'm going to start with this example of uh, Moneyball. How many of you guys have heard about Moneyball? Anybody not heard about Moneyball? Okay. So, you know, one of the themes of the MBA program now is kind of the Moneyballization of everything. Okay. And here we got this guy named Billy Bean. And we had Billy Bean come to orientation last year to uh, welcome all of our MBA students. And we did a case around how you can use analytics in a business like uh, baseball. So what was it that was so revolutionary about this guy, Billy Bean? What is it that he did that transformed baseball so much, right? What he did was written about in this book by Michael Lewis. And for those of you who know nothing about baseball, you probably know something about this guy. And maybe you've seen this movie. So you know, when I do this talk for Chinese people or Indian people, they, they have no idea what baseball is. And they're like, oh, yeah, right, Moneyball. I saw that movie on the plane, right? <laughs> and so what was the message that Billy Bean gave to our students? last year during orientation. Right? The message was that every single business nowadays is being transformed through the use of data, through the use of analytics. In such a way that somebody who has a general knowledge, like an MBA, somebody who has what I think of as a PhD in common sense, can wander into a business and outperform those people who have spent their entire lives in that business because they've based their decisions entirely on experience and intuition. Okay? So you know, what is it that he's done? He basically said, right, rather than relying on intuition and experience, let's look at data and use that data to make better decisions. Now, this has become such a huge industry now, right, sports analytics, that there's an annual conference at MIT, the MIT Sports Analytics Conference. And every year, we send about a dozen MBAs to this conference to participate in various case competitions and so forth. It's sometimes referred to as Dorkapalooza, <laughs> OK? And that's because. You know, the geeks who didn't get to hang out with the jocks in high school, now they get to hang out with the jocks, and the jocks keep coming up to them and asking them for insights. And so just about every general manager of every uh, professional sports franchise in America attends this conference to get insight about how to do their business better. Now, the idea that Billy Bean had was primarily around what we might think of as human resources, right? How do you identify employees who are going to be good? Right? or better than what you might think they are, because it's a competitive market. So really what they're doing is nothing different from what a hedge fund manager might be doing, looking for underpriced stocks and overpriced stocks, buying the underpriced stocks and shorting the overpriced stocks, and just applying that logic to human resources. Now, we're, going to we're not going to talk about human resources here, although that too, human resource analytics, is a gigantic field. I'm actually kicking off for the first time this summer a course for our evening weekend MBA students on uh, human resource analytics, about how to hire people, how to you know, uh, uh, promote them, how to evaluate their work, and so forth using uh, data. But the thing about this insight around the use of data is that it's moved in the sports industry beyond HR and into things like operations and strategy. Right? So for instance, you can use analytics to figure out right, what the strengths and weaknesses are of an individual player. Like, well, Steph Curry has very few weaknesses. So it's all about kind of relative strengths and weaknesses. And then you can use this to create a team that has complementary strengths and weaknesses. You can also use it to design in-game strategy to figure out where to locate the player. And you can also, if you do analytics on the opponent, right, figure out how to thwart the opponent's objectives. So of course, you still have to have strategic <laughs> insights, but those strategic insights are leveraged through the use of data which is very easy to collect and, uh, and to display in a way that's understandable to humans. Okay, now this has moved beyond simply baseball to more complicated sports like, uh, like football and basketball. And, you know, whenever there's a team element, it's harder to evaluate. But it's even moved to things like soccer. Right? So last year I was in Madrid at a conference and I met this guy who was the chief's, chief analytics officer for FC Barcelona. Okay, now, you guys know, if you know anything about soccer, you know that FC Barcelona has a very unique style of play. And this guy, who was their chief analytics officer, he used to work for Telefonica. And he had a PhD in network theory. Right? Now, what the heck is a guy with a PhD in network? He used to, you know, route networks of, uh, of, you know, telecom network. What the heck is this guy doing working for a sports franchise? So he was actually designing passing patterns for practice. Right? For these players, telling them how on practice days they should be kicking the ball between each other to create a unique network that was different from all of the passing networks of all of the other teams that they were competing against. Okay? And if you look at, you know, if you do some kind of cluster analysis on you know, passing patterns, you see that FC Barcelona is off in its own unique cluster. And it's all because of the combination of analytics 
with, with sports strategy. Okay, now we have here at uh, the San Francisco Giants, um, there's a, uh, another Wharton uh, graduate who is the chief information officer uh, who I had come and speak in our sports management class last year. And, and he described how they became the first team in uh, Major League Baseball to install this thing called Field FX into their stadiums. Now, every stadium has this sort of uh, data capture technology. Now, why did they do this? Well, because if you go back to Billy Bean and you think about the statistics that he was using, you can only design analytical models using the data that you have in some kind of tabular form, right? In order to run the numbers, it needs to be actually formatted in a way that where you have these useful metrics. And so what happened, what's interesting, is that the A's started bringing in all these people who are great hitters, because it's very easy to measure hitting. But it turned out they became like the worst fielding team in all of baseball, because you don't know how to measure fielding. In fact, the only statistic associated with fielding was error. Now, what the heck is an error? Right, an error is when you get close enough to the ball and it bounces off your glove. Now, what if you're like so slow that like you never get near the ball? No errors, right? So you're a better player, right? It's ridiculous. It's like the number of interceptions in football. If you're really good as a defensive back, no one throws anywhere near you. You don't have any interceptions. Okay, so this clearly is not a good way to measure performance in the field. What we want to know is kind of you know, closing speed. We want to know proximity to the ball. We want to know whether or not you make good judgment as to where to situate yourself and, you know, whether you make the right approach and so forth. But we didn't have any numbers for this because we didn't know how to measure it. So the first place to start would be to install cameras in the stadium to measure, right, the movement of the players. And then we can take that kind of raw data and somehow convert it into rows and columns so that we can actually make some sense about it. Okay, so the first piece is the data capture, and that comes from the cameras. But what has to happen between the data capture piece and sort of the, the metric that we devise, which is somehow measuring the quality of defensive performance? Right? A lot has to happen, because if you think about the data that's being captured by these cameras, right, it's unstructured, it's just a bunch of pixels, and those pixels are changing continuously over time. So what do we need to do? Right? We need to convert it somehow. Right? So having the data is just you know, the beginning. We have to ultimately convert it into useful information. Okay? So what do you think the vast majority of the data is that you're capturing you know, on this field? Nothing. Nothing. Just a patch of grass. Okay? So the first thing we have to do is we have to extract movement. Like something has to be changing. Okay? Now, what's the vast majority of the movement that you're capturing? Seagulls. Right? And pigeons and little pieces of like potato chip wrappers that are like skipping across the field. So, you know, that's useless. So we have to somehow, right, get rid of that and focus on movements of actual players and this thing called the ball and so forth. Okay? So this is a lot of software. You have to actually have a lot of software to make this work. Right? It's kind of like when Google first started out with Google Street View, you know, they would drive by your house and take a picture, and you know, you'd be out there like getting your newspaper and your underwear, right? You can't have that. So they decided they're going to pixelate everybody's face. Now, of course, you know, if it's your house, they still know who it is, unless you're like, who is that guy coming out of my house, right? <laughs> That's weird. I always thought I was on vacation that week. Um, so the thing about that software is that when they first were pixelating all the human faces, they couldn't distinguish between human faces and cow faces. So, you know, you'd look at a Google Street View in the middle of Iowa and you'd see all these cows and pigs with <laughs> pixelated faces, right? So a lot of software has to go into sort of extracting what it is that's useful, okay? And so between the data capture and the analytics, there's all of this stuff that's happening, which we typically call machine learning, okay? And so machine learning is probably the most exciting area for anybody to be in uh, right now. Okay, so, you know, what we're talking about here is, is big data. And there's all sorts of definitions of this. You've probably heard of the three V's, right, where there's volume, which has to do with the massive amount of data that's coming through. You've probably heard about variety, which is sort of all the different formats that the data comes in, right? It could be sort of, you know, uh, Twitter feeds. It could be sort of transaction records. It could be um, sort of, you know, video capture and so forth. 
And then there's what we call velocity, which is the speed with which you need to be able to process and retrieve the relevant data. So imagine every time you go on a website and there's a little banner right there, okay? What happens when you log on or you open up that web page, or if it's on your phone, right, more likely, is a message goes out and say, hey, anybody want to know? Look, Winston is now looking at his phone. Anybody interested in buying a little piece of real estate on this guy's phone? And so everybody's like, oh, okay, I don't know. I might interest. Tell me a little more about Winston. I need to know what he is. You know, who is he? Who is this guy? He's like a Haas alum. He's kind of, you know, I don't know, decent looking guy in his <laughs> late 20s. I don't know. <laughs> right? You know, I don't know. What's Bad his... analytics. <laughs> Bad... <laughs> yeah. Sell that, give or fire that guy, right? So, you know, they have to be able to process this information very, very quickly in order to submit a bid to buy that piece of real estate. If it takes like a month, if you have to wait till the end of the month to do some batch processing of all this data, okay, it's a little bit too late, right, to get a piece uh, of real estate on his phone. Okay, so all of this requires massive amounts of computing power, all of it requires you know, sophisticated forms of uh, machine learning uh, and algorithms. So what are some of the applications the companies have been using? Now, the airlines have been doing this for years, right? They've been doing big data since for, for ages. So what happens, right, when you log on to buy an airline ticket? Okay, where does the price come from? So the computer reservation systems of these airlines, and again, they've been doing this for a long time, this dynamic pricing, is they will look at the real-time demand for this particular flight. They'll look at the real-time supply in their airline for this particular flight. They'll also look at the real-time supply of their competitors to figure out how many seats are available on alternative routes, okay? Then they'll also, in addition to using real-time data, they will use predictive analytics, because they'll say, well, you know, this is what we think the demand is gonna look like going forward. And if we charge this price today, a lot of those people who are buying the ticket would have bought it later for a higher price, okay? And all of that is, is, is you have a model which computes all of the different implications of different prices, and as a result, you see the prices fluctuating uh, quite a bit, okay? And this, as massively increased the profitability of, of the airlines. But we also see dynamic pricing starting to get applied to just about every other aspect of pricing. So the San Francisco Giants, again, they used to have six different price points, right? Front row, back row, outfield, infield, right? Weekend, weekday, maybe six different price points. And as a result, for half of their games, they had empty seats, and for the other half of their games, Right, the demand exceeded the supply, and you saw tickets being resold in the secondary market, and they were failing to capture that extra surplus. So they made a shift. They engaged this company called QQ, which was founded by a PhD student at the University of Texas. Uh, and they introduced, now they have 6,000 different price points. And the prices change in real time. <clears throat> so what do you think are some of the factors that cause the prices to change? Weather. Weather, that's right. So if you have a forecast for a nice sunny day, prices go up. What else? Opponent. Opponent, absolutely. If you're playing the A's or you're playing the Dodgers, right, the price is going to be higher. Now, of course, a team like the Dodgers might start off with a really good record, and as their record starts to decline, then you might see the prices of those opponent games uh, going down. What else? Player injuries. Right? What if Madison Baumgartner, you know, like, twists his ankle, okay? The game that he was going to start will now become cheaper. Okay? And as a result, these guys, the San Francisco Giants, have increased their revenue like 30% without doing anything other than adding a little bit of software. Okay? They didn't have to change the content on the field. They didn't have to change the stadium design or anything like that. All they had to do is add a little bit of software, and they have been selling out every single game right, since the introduction of this software. Now, it helps to have a great team, of course, right? but great teams are expensive, and so a little bit of extra revenue is going to help you to provide better content on the field. Question on that? Yeah. So how does QQ make their money? Do they take percentage of that? So, so yeah, I, the, nature of the, the, the nature of the contract, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not privy to the specific details of that, but yeah, they work as sort of a provider of software, but they also will provide consulting services because there's a lot of human factors that go into it, right? So you, know, you can't just simply automate the entire process of, of price setting because they have to understand the nature of the customer, they have to understand the nature of the game, they have to understand the reputational impact of certain things. So, you know, it's not the kind of thing where you can just plug in and expect it to happen automatically. Okay, now that company is doing it for a bunch of other teams as well. Okay, what about things like parking meters? How many times do you drive around and you realize there's no empty parking spaces? 
So it was estimated that something like 25% of all downtown congestion in San Francisco was people driving around looking for parking. <laughs> okay? So this is clearly a situation where the supply and the demand are not matching. So what San Francisco has done recently is they've gone from sort of a flat pricing, right, to a pricing structure which goes up and down depending on the time of day, depending on the day of the week, depending on whether there is a baseball game on, right, on the Embarcadero, the, you'll see the prices change, okay? Now how do they do that? Of course you need to have a different sort of parking meter so you can program it in this way. But this is not true dynamic pricing. In order for it to be true dynamic pricing, what would you need? Real time. Real time, right? So the prices would vary and so as a result, suppose that you're approaching uh, right, a, a block and you want to park on this block and as the spots start filling up, the remaining empty spots become more and more expensive. Okay? Now if this were the case, you would always be able to find a parking spot. Of course, it might be very, very expensive. And you might be kind of shocked because you, you pull into the spot, you get out of the car, you walk up to the meter, and you're like, oh, $82 an hour, <laughs> you know, get back in the car. So what would you need to have in order to have truly dynamic pricing for parking? What are the technological requirements? You need sensors. You need sensors, right? So you need sensors. Now we actually have sensors in a lot of the parking spaces in San Francisco already. Okay, what else would we need? Feedback. Yeah, yeah, so you, what you need is you need to have an app and so you say, hey, I'm looking for parking and the app would display all of the different prices. Now we already have that as well, right, for all the parking garages. So, and you know, once we have completely autonomous driving, all you have to do is punch in, hey, maximum price, $40, maximum distance, you know, two blocks from destination, uh, and then it, your car will automatically take you to the spot that makes most sense for you. Yes, question? Yes, so, so. absolutely. So the granularity, right, of the data, absolutely. I'll show you in a second kind of how granular you can get, but ultimately you're right. There's always going to be some human element uh, that will be complementary to the automated processes. Now ultimately what we want to do is want to automate as much as possible, right? Because anytime a human is making some kind of judgment or decision, okay, a computer can learn that, right? So for instance, I had someone who was a co-founder of, uh, of, a, of a new kind of fintech startup uh, come and speak in my class last year. And he talked about how they had to hire these uh, credit officers, these loan officers to evaluate all the applications. And so they basically just used that to train their model. And you know, ultimately what they're going to do is just get rid of these people. Right? Or actually you know, have them start working on the harder and harder and harder cases. So ultimately, the goal is to you know, use machine learning to replicate as much as possible of, of human judgment. I guess uh, the corporation wants that to be made, for example, uh, for example uh, if I was in the industry, right, I would say, well, should I need data to analyze uh, uh, if, uh, how a particular actor or a particular release, yes. or a particular whatever, will that, I know all this information about all this stuff, and it might, useless. Absolutely, and absolutely. All the yeah. evidence of this is useless. Right. So when does that conversation happen as where should we use big data, when should we use data, big yeah. data how to measure big data, and so forth. What that's that's absolutely you're probably the hugest question that we can ask. And so we have a class now here at Haas called Data Strategy. Right? And the idea behind data strategy is that as an MBA, as a manager, right, you're not actually going to be doing all the computer science associated with the use of big data, but you have to be the person who is sort of sitting on top of this whole process, making sure that no silly mistakes are made. So there's a famous example of this, actually, I'll tell you, just to go off script. Um, there's this website called um, OkCupid. Yeah. Has any, anybody heard of this? It's actually set up by a bunch of data scientists uh, from, from Harvard, and the idea is to use data science to help make better matches, okay? And so uh, the data science team was just doing some text analytics to try and figure out you know, what led to a response from a recipient of one of these emails. So typically what happens is a man sends an email to a woman and the woman either ignores it or responds. And so they wanted to provide some guidance to people, like here's what you put in your email in order to get a higher response rate. You know, that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do if you're a data scientist. You know, they were thinking about the customer. So they did some text analytics and what they found was that if you use the word beautiful in your email, the response rate is lower than if you don't have words like beautiful and sexy and so forth. So they sent out to a message to all of the users, don't use these words beautiful because you'll get a lower response rate. Okay? And so people were like, okay, they follow the advice and the response rate went down even further. 
Right? So what was the problem here? Right? The only thing that, that the data science can do is uncover the correlations. They can't understand the causal relationship. They'd have to do some kind of experiment to figure that out. They didn't do an experiment. Does anybody know what's actually going on there? Does anybody have a theory? So when I ask people, they're like, well, anybody who uses the word beautiful is like desperate. And so that's why you know, people don't want to respond to it. It makes perfect sense, right? So you can always reverse engineer an explanation into any correlation. Does anybody know what was really going on there? There is a, right, there's a lurking variable, which is the actual beauty of the recipient. So it turns out that if you are, in fact, beautiful, you get more emails. And so your response rate is lower. So the people who were using, who were getting emails that had the word beautiful in it actually were tended to be beautiful. And so of course they have a lower response rate, right? So it wasn't that the use of the word beautiful was causing the low response rate. It's that the low response rate and the use of the word beautiful were both caused by a third variable, which is the actual beauty of the recipient. Okay, which is why deleting that word from the email was a bad idea. <laughs> okay, so look, we see dynamic pricing everywhere. We see it on freeways now, right? On uh, you know the Beltway in DC, which responds to real-time uh, demand. And look at this. This is from a couple years ago. This is from like 2012, I believe. This shows you for a 24-hour sales cycle, right? The price of this same item, this General Electric microwave oven, on three different websites. You've got Sears. You've got Amazon and you've got Best Buy. So Amazon changes prices nine times. Sears doesn't change prices at all. Now, which company is bankrupt? <laughs> and which company is one of the most valuable companies in the world? What do you think? Now, how do you suppose they figured this out? Why did they cut the price of a microwave oven at 6 p.m.? Anybody have a theory here? That's when they found that it was broken. Yeah. <laughs> right, and they order a new one. Yeah, but then if, you've, if it's broken, your, your, your price elasticity, right? You should be very inelastic, yeah. so you should pay a higher price because you need it. Anybody else have a theory? Yeah. Yeah. But then you would see a higher price, not a lower price. <laughs> They're driving home, but then, you know, you don't have a whole lot of time to do, like, comparative shopping, otherwise you'll crash. I mean, my theory is that right here, you know, you, the, the Google boss is coming to pick you up or the train's coming to get you at 5 o'clock and you're like, last minute, you're like, oh shoot, my spouse said buy that microwave oven. And so, you know, you only have a few minutes and so you're not very, uh, you're, you're not very price sensitive. But when you finally get home and you're like, oh, I'm just in front of my home computer, I got plenty of time, you know, you're more price elastic. But the key thing is they don't have a team of, you know, sociologists sitting around debating like what kind of prices they should be charging for these things. They just use experiments. You know, they just move the prices up and down and see what it works. That's how they tease out the elasticity of demand through experimentation, okay? And so, look, if you look at how many prices change in any given day in Amazon, there are like three million price changes a day, right? Log on to your cart and you'll see things changing in price all the time. Now, here's the thing. They don't just change the price based on the time of day, but they also will change the price based on your location. So there are a lot of websites that charge different prices for different locations. So right here's something at staples.com, the same exact item, $1,000 more, right? So in Palo Alto, you might pay $1,200, and here in Berkeley, you pay $1,100. Why? Because the pricing guy went to Haas. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, because look, the elasticity of demand is going to be different. First of all, how do they even know where you are when you're logging on? Your IP address, right? Sure, you can try to hack it and they'll make you. Absolutely. So there's a bit of an arms race going on. So, you know, if you think back to with pricing of airline tickets, you know, there were guys who would, uh, you know, design these algorithms to try and tell you when, whether you should wait or buy now, right? So there's lots of try, ways to try to outsmart this. But knowing where you are tells you something. It's not just about your price sensitivity based on income, but how far are you from a bricks and mortar store? Right? What's the trade-off? If you have to get in your car and drive a couple hours, okay, you're willing to pay a higher price for the product. Okay? And of course, we all know what Uber does with surge pricing. You know, it's a really a brilliant way to equate supply and demand to get people more drivers into the areas where there's higher demand. And their goal is to make transportation like running water. You know, you turn on the faucet, there it is. You get on your Uber, and there's a car. And the only way to do that is to have 
dynamic pricing. OK, now there's this famous story you probably heard about, right? Anybody not heard the Target story by now? Right, so what happened here is this guy is going through his mail and he sees an ad for diapers for his 17-year-old daughter from Target. And he's really livid. So he runs down to the local Target store and talks to the store manager and says, what are you doing sending my 17-year-old daughter diaper coupons? The guy's very, very apologetic. Okay, the father goes home and describes his heroic deed and the daughter says, but dad, I'm pregnant. Now how did Target know that she was pregnant before she before he knew, her own father knew that she was pregnant. Right, what's going on here? Right, so, so they have, so you know, I asked my students this and one of them said, well, uh, she was dating the store manager. <laughs> I was like, well that would be a very old school way to uncover this information, no doubt, right? But no, right, they use predictive analytics based on her Purchase history. So based on what she's been purchasing lately, right, they have a model which says, you know what, she's probably likely to be buying diapers sometime soon. And if we can get her to buy her first diapers from Target, then we can get her to buy the next three years worth of diapers. Okay, so how do they know her purchase history? Right, you guys have all been using these loyalty cards for years. And so all these companies have, right, purchase histories, which they use. So I had the, the head of Safeway. Uh, IT come in and speak to my class last week and he was describing how, you know, they can pick up like whether or not, so if somebody starts buying uh, organic uh, vegetables and then they stop buying tomato sauce, okay, what does that tell you? It tells you you need some organic tomato sauce on your shelves, right? Because the customers moved into organic category and they start dropping it. What if they continue to buy, right? Um, uh, they, they stop buying bread and they stop buying pasta. Well, then you know you need some gluten-free stuff on your shelves, okay? So this is all picked up by the purchase history. Uh, and everybody has these cards, right? Well, we don't have cards anymore. We have virtual cards. But every vendor wants to maintain a relationship that allows them to know you not only as part of this collectivity so they can pick up trends, but they want to know you as an individual, okay? So the bricks and mortar stores, right, have a disadvantage here because they don't always have an easy way of identifying you as an individual customer. So some of these stores would actually have right, a customer identifier for your online purchases, and then when you walk into the bricks and mortar store, you're just like random anonymous person, okay? So you, know, you have to log in to buy on Macy's.com, you have to log in to buy something from, say, United, okay? Uh, and what's the, useful, what's the use value of knowing everything about the individual, right? Not only because you can design these aggregate uh, models of, of consumer behavior, but because you can then provide the individual customer with individual things like recommendations. Now you all know how Netflix has been doing this for years. Like I don't want to know what the average person thinks. So if I'm looking for a good movie, and I read the, you know, look at the, the, the reviews of the ordinary person, I'm going to want to go see some Superman, Batman, you know, The Rock kind of whatever explosion thing, right? But if that's not the kind of thing, I, I want to get a recommendation for someone like me. Right? So what are people like me going to like? Okay, and so that's why they've been collecting all this data and they, require, they ask people to provide reviews. They use a process called collaborative filtering. Okay, and the idea is to find people like you and move over what they like into your recommendation. So Amazon, of course, also will do something similar. Right? Whenever you look at a product, Right, they will say, there are other people like you that have also looked at these other products. Okay, and so you know, I logged on to Amazon recently and this is what I got. It was kind of depressing actually, <laughs> this view of me. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm not really as interesting as I thought I was. <laughs> you know. It's much more interesting when your daughters share your account. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so now like Netflix allows you to identify yourself as you know, which yeah. member of the household. Because it used to be that you know, I'd get on Netflix and you know, I'd see all these things. I'm like, wow, that's not, you know, I'm not interested in that. Right? So as a way of you know, identifying individual. Now look, what's happening here, if you think about it, is we're going back to the time of our great grandparents. So for thousands of, millions of years, you know, when you walked into the, the shop to buy you know, your woolly mammoth leg, right? <laughs> back in the day, they were like, hey, Jeff, how's it going? Like, I know you like the ankle cuts. They're really tender, you know, because Every merchant knew you. It's like if you go to countries like in, in, in France sometimes, you know, you walk into the wine store and they're like, oh yeah, you know, you like burgundies. Okay, here's your burgundy. You love, I know you're probably eating lamb tonight, right? Whatever. They know 
you as an individual. Then we went through the dark ages of 100 years where you're just this anonymous person and you walk into a store and they have to guess sort of averages about you. Okay? Now we're returning to an era where merchants know you as an individual and can provide you with individualized, customized service. Okay? And so, you know, there's an art to it because people's attention span is limited. So, you know, when Amazon first started out, they would send emails to people saying, these are the books that you're going to like the most. And you get them and you're like, yeah, I know. In fact, I already bought that. Like, duh. Right? And so you stop looking at these emails. And so there's an art to finding exactly that sweet spot where the recommendation is so, it's not something you're going to buy anyway, and it's not something that you're never going to buy. They're looking for that little incremental right, push towards purchase that wouldn't be there otherwise. Okay? And the way in which all of this is done is through A-B testing. So if you've been to Steve Blank's talk this morning, right, there are no uh, sacred idols anymore. Everything is subject to experimentation. So back in the old days, if you had a bunch of people come into a room and they would have some kind of disagreement about what the product features ought to look like, right, how would that debate be settled? Right, you know about the hippo concept, right? The highest paid person in the room would typically decide. Now, at decent companies, at good companies, at well-run companies, if there's two people that disagree, they say, all right, let's have a bake-off. I think the one on the left, the page view on the left is going to work. You think the page view on the right is going to work? Fine, let's, let's duke it out. We'll send half the people this one, half the people this one, and see what works. And in many cases, you can find out in 30 seconds who's right. Okay? So, for instance, who would have known that a green button will lead to 34% higher conversion rate than a red button? Right? It's crazy. Like, you learn these things. You could spend 10 years trying to develop a better product and spend millions of years on R&D and all you had to do was change the color of your button. <laughs> it didn't cost you anything. You get the same ROI. Okay? You know this because of A-B testing. Okay, so as I was mentioning, right, there are these bricks and mortar merchants that have been struggling to identify, although Safeway has been doing a great job. And then once you add in these different channels, right, you want to somehow merge the online presence of your individual customer with the bricks and mortar identification of your individual customer. So, so how do these companies do this? Right, like Macy's? So every time you go into a Macy's to buy something now in bricks and mortar, they will ask you for your email. Right? Or they'll ask you for your phone number. And then they can stitch together that purchase right, with your online identity. So they have a comprehensive view of you as an individual. Now, things get even more interesting once you move beyond the purchase decision. Right, so we, you know, what I've been talking about, knowledge about what you purchased, that's what I call shallow data. Okay, there's this, there's this concept called deep data, which I call deep data, which is what if we can follow the purchase, follow the activity of the buyer all the way past the purchase decision, right? So you go to Macy's and you buy a blender. So I'm like, oh yeah, Pete bought a blender. That's it, that's all I know. What I don't know is how often does he use the blender? Is he making daiquiris or is he making kale shakes, you know? Like what exactly is he doing with this thing? Right. Is it broken? Is it not broken? Now, if I have a connected blender that's continually feeding information back to me about how he's using his blender, then that gives me a whole wealth of new information, which is helpful in my recommending things to, uh, to Pete over here. So think about when you buy a book. I, I, I read about 10% of the books that I buy. Okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's high. I I'm on a, I'm on a, used to be more like 15%. Now it's 10%. But the thing is, Amazon doesn't know which books I read as long as I buy paper books. But if I buy a digital book through a Kindle, not only do they know which books I read, but when I read them, right, how many times I had to sit down and read them, how quickly I read them, you know, did I skim them, what sections did I underline, right? So which sections did I think were important, okay? Did I share the book, right? They know all of this stuff, okay? If I listen, if I buy a CD, how many times do I play that CD? No one knows. Right? They don't even know if I took the cellophane off the thing. But if I use something like Spotify, they know that I've listened to this song 10,000 times and this song only once. Okay? Now you're starting to think, wow, this is going to change the way you can price things. Right? If you're thinking that, then you're right. And there's lots of apps like Next Issue that's actually changed its name recently, but for magazines. I was talking to someone from Condé Nast, and I said, hey, 
you know, you publish these gigantic things like Vogue, right? Vogue has this one page in every issue by this guy, he writes about food, Jeffrey Steingarten. If you're a foodie, you know about this guy. So I remember I would go to Vogue and I would go right to that page, read it, and then throw the Vogue out. And I was like, how would you know if that's what's happening? He's like, well, we don't know. We have no way of knowing. Okay, if you have a digital issue, you know what articles are being read, you know what advertisements are being looked at. And so they're a little nervous. They're like, well, what if the advertisers find out that no one's looking at their ads? And I was like, you think they're real idiots, don't you? Right? Of course they know that only a small percentage are looking at the ads, but they don't know about the ones that are actually being looked at a lot. And this way you could demonstrate to them. Okay? So we can start to do even more specific things. Like how many times have you been to a store where you walk past one of these things and it goes like, don't forget to buy your dish soap. Right? Have you seen this? Anybody had something like this happen? Now the problem is that you know, you might already have the dish soap in your, in, your, in your cart and you're like, oh, that's cool. I get another 30 cents off something I was going to buy anyway. Right? Or, you know, what happens if it's a kid like running past the thing and the thing comes out, dish soap. Right? The kids, no, doesn't, if a dog goes by this thing, this thing will crank out. Okay? So it's wonderful that they have these things, but what we really want is we want to give coupons and promotions only to those people who wouldn't have otherwise bought the product. Okay? So what we now have in many retail environments are these things called beacons. And what beacons can do is they can track right, the movement of the customer within the store. Now you can do this anonymously or you can do it in a way that has customer identifier. Okay, so you know, we can find out like what aisles do people walk down and you know, how do they travel throughout the store? What kinds of things do they look at? Right, because think on a website, if you put something in your basket and then you remove it from the basket, right, or you take your cursor and you hang out in front of something for a while, okay, we know that. But what happens in the store environment? We don't know. So some stores are putting in place cameras. Walmart's now putting in cameras so they can tell if you're standing in front of the Fruit Loops for like an hour and they're like, nah, I don't want the Fruit Loops. They can pick that up now. Okay? And so the beacons are helping in this way. Okay? And not only can we do it anonymously, but we can actually do it down to the individual customer. So think about something like Starbucks. Now, ultimately people are saying, oh, as soon as you walk in the store, they'll have facial recognition or whatever. And they'll be like, okay, you know, hey, you need this. You need a better shirt, my friend. That kind of thing. I guess you wouldn't need any personal data to know that. All right. <laughs> But look, think about how many of you guys have the Starbucks app? Okay, now you're thinking the great thing about the Starbucks app is that I can buy my coffee before I go in the store, right? Well, that's fantastic. But the, what's the real advantage to Starbucks? I mean, obviously reducing frictions, allowing you to right, make your purchase more easily. Um, also, maybe giving you a promotion if you walk. This is another way of gaming the thing, right? You want to go get your Starbucks? Here, try this out. Walk past it. <laughs> like, don't go in. You know, just say, I really want that Starbucks, but I'm going to pretend like I don't want the Starbucks and I'm going to keep walking. And then you might just get a little coupon saying, come on, you know you want this Starbucks, right? Okay? So, you know, a little strategy that you can use to try and, you know, get, get these coupons. But really, you know, what's the real value add for Starbucks? Well, they can actually track wait times, right? So they know how long you're standing in line before you have to pay at the register. And then they know how long you have to wait to get your coffee. Okay? So they know, hey, maybe we have too many people at the cash register, not enough people over in the barista. And they can reallocate the labor. Or what if store A has longer wait times than store B? We can re reallocate the labor. In fact, we can automate this because we actually have automated right, employee scheduling. So you can just have a whole process automated so you can optimize the usage of labor. So you don't have people standing around in some stores and other stores where everybody's running around. Okay? Now, this guy he came and spoke at Haas a couple years ago, and he's a PhD uh, uh, from MIT. He was one of Rich's classmates, and he was running uh, the um, uh, Caesars for a while. Now, why would you need a PhD in finance from MIT to run a gaming company? <coughs> what did this guy do? Of course, Caesars is bankrupt now. It's, you know, bad leverage. So, you know, you don't always want a PhDs in finance handling your the debt side of things. But yeah, so every customer, right, would get a loyalty card, and so they could track the behavior of these customers, okay? And so one of the things he's described learning, he said, um, you know, when customers come into the slot machines, if they don't win something in the first 20 minutes, they leave the store, they leave the casino, and you'll never see them again. So they actually changed the algorithm for awarding prizes on those slot machines so that everyone would get a reward, you know, within 20 minutes. 
Okay, then boom, you get that little dopamine burst and you're, you know, you're in there for the whole day, okay? <laughs> These guys know more behavioral finance than anybody else. These guys are geniuses and they use it all, and they have a whole data science team that's designed to, uh, uh, to, to you know, enhance the customer experience, they call it. Enhance the shareholder experience is really uh, a more accurate description, okay? Now, you guys have all known, anybody here been to Disney World recently? Do you use the magic bands? Oh, these things are fantastic, aren't they? You don't think they're creepy? <laughs> you like them? Okay, so the way this works is every member of your family gets one of these bands, and now you no longer have to carry your wallet, you no longer have to carry your car keys, or, well, car keys you don't need, your, uh, your hotel room key. You just use this band to get into the park, you get into every single ride, you buy all of your, your beverages, and all of your food, and it even transmits your identification to, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse. So if your kid walks up to Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse will be like, hey, Johnny, how you doing? And he can also kind of cross sell and say, hey, Johnny, you know, I know you want a Coke, there's one right over there. No, they can do all sorts of things, right? So, you know, the, the, the customer appeal is, just like with, the, with the, the loyalty cards, you're trying to get the, the customers these discounts, you have to kind of induce them to provide you with this data. So the, induc the inducement here is the frictionless experience, but what can they do with all this data? Right, you can use it for operations, right? So you can decide how do we get rid of the bottlenecks, right, throughout the, the, uh, the park. Uh, we can also use it for planning uh, of, you know, inventory levels of different things like food and beverages and so forth. But we can also kind of see, right, what are people interested in? Right, the people who like this ride, what else do they like? And if somebody, for instance, goes on uh, the Little Mermaid, do they have a Little Mermaid ride? I don't know, but if they go on the Little Mermaid ride like 50 times, well then, boom, you know you're gonna start getting some, some emails for, for Little Mermaid uh, you know, lunch boxes and, and all the other stuff that Disney is good at, at selling. Yeah? How are companies using this data when they interact with kind of like the human experience and or regulations? The, the casino, how can it be legal to make sure that somebody wins in the first 20 minutes when you yeah. still be a gaming? Right. You go to Starbucks, you know, you want to optimize your employee force, but nobody's going to show up for two hours, two days a week because they're busy on Monday morning. Yeah, no, it's great. So there are a lot of regulations, right? So in the casino business, you can't actually use individual algorithms. You have to apply the algorithms to everybody. Right? Um, other times, there's no regulation. So at Amazon, they originally, they, they tried to give different prices to different people. So people would log on on their friend's computer and they'd be like, wait, this is cheaper. And so they got a lot of blowback, so they stopped doing that. Not for regulatory reasons, but because uh, for customer reputation uh, reasons. You know, in Starbucks case, they were actually tracking the, the wait times uh, an anonymously, right? Uh, and, and people got really upset about privacy invasion. So now they only do it using data provided by people who have the apps. Because if you download the app, you're basically kind of giving them permission uh, to use this data. Okay, so you know, obviously there are lots of regulatory uh, uh, things, and, and the world of banking in particular is one that has tons of regulation about how personal data can be used. And of course, healthcare is the other area where uh, you know, there's lots of regulations. Education is another one, right? So you know, grades of students, these are things that we can't use. Your, your applications to Haas, you know, we actually throw them out. Um, which is frustrating for me because I'm trying to figure out like uh, we've got successful alums and maybe not so successful alums and if we could go back and figure out like what did the successful alums say on their application, <laughs> right? We could use a little machine learning and figure out like how to redesign, how to redesign our admissions criteria but we can't do that, right? Because of those darn rescue regulations. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so people can opt into these things. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, look, when it comes to location data, I mean, your phone provides so much information. You have no idea how much information your phone is providing on things like location, right? So, you know, this is a typical phone user, maybe, uh, you know, as you're doing this. You can do this. You can get on your phone and actually see what data is being collected about your location and who's getting access to it. So most of the apps that you have on your phone, you know, they're all tracking where you are and so forth. 
Um, but you know, where is this useful? What about credit card transactions? How many of you guys have gone traveling abroad and then your credit card doesn't work? You go to a restaurant in Europe and they're like, sorry. <laughs> You're like, oh, well, I guess I'm washing dishes tonight, right? Okay, this would never happen. If they know where you are based on your phone, right, then why would they reject a credit card transaction uh, with the belief that it's, it's fraudulent, okay? Um, they can also provide, again, these sort of location-specific promotions, depending on what aisle of the store you're in. So the way I look at this is that every one of these vendors has sort of a narrow slice of you. Amazon knows what you purchase from Amazon. Netflix knows what movies you watch. Right? Safeway knows what groceries you buy. Macy's knows kind of what uh, you know, white goods you purchase. And that's wonderful. But wouldn't it be so much more valuable if Amazon knew what movies you were watching? I mean, that's why they have Amazon Prime. But if they knew what movies you were watching on a different platform, well, what if right, Macy's knew right, what kind of groceries you were buying? If they knew you were buying a lot of kale, they might suggest one of these blenders. You can start making one of those nasty shakes, right? <laughs> so you know, what you really want to do is you want to splice together all these individual like, facets of, of a person into a single comprehensive view of them. Now, how do you do this? Who does this? Google, right? Google does this. Because not only, if I have your search history, if I know your search history, I know you better than your spouse, okay? I know you better than your spouse. And not only do they have your search history, but they also have your email, okay, if you use Gmail. And they also, if you use Chrome, have your browsing history. So all the information they have about you, they give, give you such a comprehensive view so that when you go searching for things, right, you get individualized, customized recommendations. So when Google first started, it was all based on links. So if I typed in Chinese restaurant, I'd get like, wow, <laughs> Chinese restaurant, it's in Manhattan. Hey, I'm in San Francisco. Oh, it's Szechuan. I like Hunan. What? Right? What you want is you want everyone wants to, everyone should get a special individualized, customized output, right, for not only the organic search, but also for, for paid search, right? And also for banner ads and everything else. Now, who knows even more than Google? Facebook. Facebook knows you better than your mother. Okay? Because not only do they, they don't even have to ask you any questions, right? So when Facebook first started out, they would say like, what movies do you like? And you'd like, oh, I like this movie. And what kind of uh, books do you like? Well, I like this book. And you have to like, you know, write down all your favorites. Then they came up with the like button. And you're like, well, I like it. Okay, that's really easy. Now they don't even have to ask you. If you never, ever, ever go on Facebook and do anything on Facebook, but you have a Facebook account and you're logged in, you know, they don't need to ask you anything. Because every single website you land on that has a Facebook like button, that information goes back to Facebook. Okay, so they know more about you than pretty much anybody else. They know more about you than you know about you. Okay, they can t you can do one of these psychological tests on your, on your Facebook account. It'll tell you stuff you didn't even know about yourself. Just kind of cool. And the whole point of this, why is this a good thing for you, for them to know you? Because they can provide you with customized ads, right? And you're thinking, why the heck would I want customized ads? What's the point of an ad? It's to provide you with information. Who wants useless information? We all want useful information. So you've probably heard this phrase a million times, John Wanamaker. He said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. Now, I think he's exaggerating. He's, he's like understating this by a huge factor. I think 99.9% .9 of traditional print media advertising is completely wasted. We just don't know which 99.9%. .9%. Okay? If we can use something like Facebook or Google to increase the accuracy of the match between the people uh, displaying the ads and the people receiving the ads, this increases your bang for buck tremendously. Now, here's the question. If advertising is more effective, will you have more of it or less of it? Okay, everyone says, well, less. Wow, I don't have to spend as much. Wrong. Basic micro 101 day one. If the marginal benefit of something goes up, do you do more of it or less of it? More of it. Okay? Which is why advertising is the biggest growth industry in America. Okay? Of course, after machine learning, which you need in order to do this. Yeah? There's a piece of software you can run that will tell you what Facebook knows about you. Yes. It's very shocking. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. And remember, that's just the raw data. Okay. That's not the insights that you can gain from that. Okay. So that's just the basic level. You take that and you interpret it and they can know all sorts of things like, you know, your sexual preference, your political party. All of that can be extracted with a high degree of accuracy just from 
uh, the things that you like. Uh, and of course, they know far more than just what you like. Yeah. Actually, there are other bunch of companies that do even better tracking with this. And so, for example, if you go on Amazon, right? You look at a book. Next time on your some other website, you will see the Amazon ads. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. A, a third party data providers, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So look, here's the way I view advertising, 20th century advertising. Okay, does anybody know what this is? Farmland. Oh, well, that's farmland. But what is all this stuff up here? What is all this? Fog? No, this is actually not fog. This is pollen. Okay? Pollen. 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 Okay? Now, this to me is an absolutely insane reproductive strategy. What you do is you release like, you know, you devote 20% of your energy to producing this stuff which you just spray out into the environment. Okay, what's your hit rate? Like one in 30 billion of these little pollen particles will ultimately land where you want it to land. Okay? All right, that is 20th century advertising. I put an ad for my car on the back of the New Yorker magazine, and I hope, I hope, that of the millions of people that read this magazine, there might be one who says, oh, wow, I wouldn't have bought this car if I didn't see this ad on the back of the New Yorker magazine. Now I'm going to run out and buy the car. Okay? This is a crazy strategy. Right? Just spray the world with pollen and hope it lands in the right spot. So look, if you want to be smarter about your advertising, you need to think like these flowers. So what's their pollen distribution strategy? They don't spray this pollen all over the world. They try to get just the right pollinators to come and help them disperse this pollen. So they'll find a fly or a bee that will take it from one flower to the next. Boom, wow, what an amazing savings. Okay, and it leaves all sorts of energy for other things like making nice beautiful flowers for us. Okay, this is even better, okay? You design a flower in such a way that only a very, very narrow type of customer can go in and get access to this pollen, okay? This is niche marketing. You know, nature's been doing niche marketing for years. My favorite example of niche marketing is this. So, Charles Darwin observed this orchid, and this orchid has this thing which sort of goes down it's very long, it's like, you know, 18 inches long, and at the very bottom of that, there's a little bit of uh, nectar, <laughs> okay? And so he hypothesized that this flower could only have evolved if there was some kind of bug that had like an 18 inch long tongue that would somehow make its way down to get that nectar, and thereby in the process pick up the pollen, which it would use to take to another one of these uh, orchids somewhere else in the forest. Now, he, he sat for many days in front of these flowers waiting for this bug, and it never showed up. But more patient, well, actually, that's, that's why God invented PhD students, right? <laughs> you, you know, you park them in front of these things for a couple months, okay? Pay them like $4 an hour. <laughs> and one of them, sooner or later, actually found this moth, okay? And this moth has an 18-inch long tongue. So here is a plant that is specifically designed just for this one type of bug, okay? Incredibly efficient. This is the future of advertising. I'm going to give ads to only those people who want to see the ads, give the ads only to those people who are interested in buying the product that I'm displaying to them. It's going to be customized down to the individual level. I will have an ad for a shirt, not just a brand, but a color and a pattern that you've been waiting for your entire life. And they will know that based on your browsing history and your purchase history. Okay? Now, my favorite example of this is an extreme case. This is actually uh, an orchid that it, it is, it actually impersonates the, uh, the uh, body of uh, a bug and emits the pheromones of this same bug. And so these bugs mate with it and then fly off with the pollen. <laughs> and that is, that's, that's kind of the kind of advertising, like that's, that's Buzzfeed, right? That's, that's a, uh, the, the kind of uh, nefarious advertising that you've all been, uh, uh, you know, there it is. He's got the pollen stuck to him uh, for his efforts. Okay, so look, what's the takeaway here? In, in the world of business, there are ten commandments, but they're all conflated down to one commandment. And that is, know thy customer. Right? 
And the more you know about your customer, the better the product and the service you can deliver. Okay? And the more successful your business will be. And the way in which you get to know your customer is through, uh, through data. Okay? So all of that had to do with sort of customer facing stuff. But I've got a whole other story which basically handles the back end, right? how your business is operated. So I'll just give you a few slides on that. I won't be able to go through all of it. Um, but, um, but look, all of this is made possible by these, these massive uh, you know, servers, server farms. It's now estimated that information processing, I think, represents something like 20% of the energy consumption or something like that. It's, it's, it's really kind of crazy. And these things are all located up in the Pacific Northwest for cheap, cheap energy and so forth. Um, so how do they know all this stuff about your, how do, they, how do you know all this stuff? So you guys remember the cookie? The cookie is sort of a 20th century way of tracking consumer behavior on the web, right? So they know kind of what pages took you to what pages and take you to what pages and so forth and so on. Okay, so what's the, the problem with these cookies? Well, there's cookie blockers and all sorts of things. But also, you know, what happens when we have different people using the same device and people using different devices? So if you have a phone and an iPad and a, and a computer, then they think of you as three different individuals. Now think of the typical individual. What happens during the course of your day? So you wake up in the morning, and if you're like many people, you have your device sort of nestled nearby, like, you know, like this. And so, you know, the first thing you do is you, you open up your iPad and you start reading the news or something like that, and looking at your email. And then you get on the BART, and then you're like, you know, like this the whole time on the BART. Maybe you're continuing an article that you started on your iPad. Okay, then you get to work and you're in front of this weird thing called a, what do you call it again? Uh, a desktop, right? And you're, you're tapping away at this thing for a while. And then, oh, it's, it's, it's lunchtime. So it's like back to your device. Did anybody know that something like 40% uh, of American kids now eat with their left hand? <laughs> Did you know this? Do you watch your kids next time they're eating? They're eating with their left hand. Now, this is not because of a huge spike in left-handed people. I'm a left-handed person myself. What's happening here? They're eating like this. Like this. Right? Because they're texting while they're eating. T-W-E, right? OK, so then they're done eating. Then you go back to work. Right? Then you get back on the BART. And you're like, right? And then you get back at home, and you go fire up this antiquated you know, piece of hardware called a desktop, and you start playing around with that thing, and then you, know, you crawl back into bed with your iPad. Okay? So look, there's three different people here, according to these three different IP addresses, three different uh, devices. So in order to put all this together, in order to splice, this is a typical customer nowadays, right? How many devices do you have? Right? So what we want to do is we want to have like a portable cookie. And of course, Google and Facebook, these are the leaders in tracking your behavior across all your different channels and all your different devices. Now I mentioned sort of third party sort of vendors of data. Like for a buck fifty, two dollars, I can pretty much know everything I need to know about you, right? From these data aggregators. Okay, and this is a, a huge industry. And so what's happened to media as a result of this trend? Well, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, okay? Are they the top media companies nowadays? Now who are the top media companies? Google and Facebook. Okay, so this is just sort of, this is actually before Facebook's most recent spike. Uh, you know, this is the performance of the New York Times. This is the performance of, of Facebook. Facebook doesn't produce any media, but they're the biggest media company in the world. Okay, so the old model, media companies knew most of what there was to know about a customer, but there really wasn't that much to know. Now there's so much more to know, and the media companies are usually the ones that are kind of uh, last to find out. Okay, so... What's your response if you're a media company? What can you do? What's your response if you're a media company? You don't know your customer. You're basically outsourcing all your customer data gathering to these third parties who know more about your customer than you do. I did a project recently for a, a European media company, and 90% uh, of their sales were from kiosks. And I was like, who's reading your paper? And they're like, well, we don't know. What parts of the paper are they reading? Well, we don't know. <coughs> what ads are being looked at? Well, well we don't know. Okay, that's not very good. So then they do a website. And then they say, well, who's tracking your usage? Well, I don't know, Google, maybe? What kind of ads, how do you get the ads on the website? Well, we have, we have Google take care of that. Okay, so they don't know what's going on with their consumers. 
And so if somebody's looking at your news, if some, suppose I'm in Chrome and, and suppose they say, oh, I'm going to start tracking the user behavior. I'm going to start tracking the user behavior. I'm going to look at what's going on here. But they're looking at the paper in Chrome. Well, yeah, you're getting the information and so too is Google. So in order for you to have useful information as a competitive advantage in your enterprise, it has to be the case that you have information that other people don't have. Because they have the same information you have, okay, then it's a commodity. So one crucial element of your data strategy is to try and figure out what kind of data can you access that no one else has, right? So the way I think about this metaphorically is if, you know, if I'm interacting with my customer on the web, then there's all these people that are watching. They're just observing and they're kind of piggybacking on any of the value that I'm generating through my, my customer uh, identification. So this is sort of the metaphor that I use in class, right? Does anybody know what this is? Okay, let me know what this is. This is actually a restroom, okay? And, right? The, the idea is that this guy can look out, but nobody else can look in. Right? It, well, you wouldn't want it to be the other way. Right? And you certainly wouldn't want it to be transparent. So how can the media companies sort of protect themselves from the prying eyes of these third parties who are ultimately taking away all of their, their rents? Well, we can have a login wall. Okay, so not just a paywall, but a login wall, right? So now that means, you know, you have to log in in order to, right, access this media. Okay, and that's going to give them kind of customer identification and so forth. Okay, but even better is to have an app, right? Because with the app, you're, you're, you're communicating directly with the customer beyond the prying eyes of uh, the um, these other companies that can use the same information. So that's why we've seen a huge move to apps, but then of course that reduces the value of search and so forth. So now a lot of these companies are starting to give access to the, the deep data and the apps to the, the search engines and so forth. Okay? And so, you know, we're seeing the appification of everything. Uh, and as a result, at least in media, it used to be that content was king. Okay, now you know what the new slogan is data's king. Okay, and this is true for every industry, every industry. So, again, I won't talk about the operations side of things much here, but when I teach my strategy class, and I've been teaching a strategy class here at Haas for uh, about 10 years or so, and I have seen some people here who were in that strategy class, and, you know, one of the messages of that class was that every cult company is now a technology company, right? And that was sort of the, the slogan and the logo that I used when I first started teaching this class 10 years ago. And then about five or six years ago, I switched my slogan and it became every company is a software company. Okay. And then, you know, about two or three years ago, I switched the slogan and I said, look, every company is a data company. Right. Every company is in the business of collecting data and leveraging that data for competitive advantage. Okay. So, you know, here's a quiz. Why did Google acquire a thermostat company? Right? Because this is a data capture device, right? This is a device that allows them to capture data about how the home is being used and how people behave in the home and who's at home and who's away and when do you come home and when do you leave, okay? And all sorts of things can be picked up. Um, Vizio just got into trouble because they had uh, cameras on their phone, on their, on their TVs, right? And why? Why would they do this? It's kind of crazy. You know, you want to know what people are watching? Okay? So there's a battle going on to figure out who's, who knows what you watch. The cable companies want to know what you're watching, but then the, tele, the, the, the uh, uh, um, TV makers want to know what you're watching. And there are actually some apps that have kind of, you know, mics on your phone, on your phone that actually pick up what you're watching uh, and then feed that information back to Nielsen if you, pass some, if you press some kind of waiver uh, or whatever. And, you know, Nest, nowadays everybody's kind of waving their privacy with Nest as they install security cameras. And so, of course, Google can, if they want to, not only keep an eye out for criminals and crooks, but they can also kind of keep tabs on, you know, what you're watching on TV because they can pick up the, the sound and use machine learning to figure out what's being, being watched. Okay? So, look, I'm, I'm going to skip over this stuff on logistics. I left it in there just for fun. I'll, I'll give you one application of logistics, which I just think is super cool. Um, uh, and then I'll tell you a quick story about General Electric, and then we'll quit. Um, but I had the chief operating officer for UPS come and speak in my class last year. And um, 
you know, he provided this, this really interesting insight because UPS is one of the companies that we do in, uh, in, in my, my class and I've been doing it for, for years about how UPS is essentially a technology company that just so happens to own some trucks. Uh, and if you really want to understand this, uh, you have to know they spend a billion dollars a year on software. Okay, they're one of the biggest software producers in the world. It's kind of crazy. Now you're thinking, why would they need all this software? Well, let me give you a test. Okay, so this is, uh, they, they just spent three billion on this latest optimization software called Orion. Um, and so this is a typical driver. A typical driver has maybe 120 packages they have to drop off in a day. So how do they decide where, which sequence of, of, of spots? This is something called the traveling salesman problem. It's a very old problem. So how is this decided? With this three pounds of fat sitting on the driver's head, okay? So the driver looks at the map and he, you know, he's been doing this for years and he knows a lot about the streets and so forth. And so he says, well, you know, I, I think this is the way I'm going to do it. So we now have this $3 billion software that will do it for you. Okay, now here's why you need $3 billion in software. So how many different ways do you think there are to deliver 120 different packages? More than that. So this is how old the Earth is in seconds. Now I should have updated the slide. It's like a year old, so the number's bigger. Okay, but that's a big number. How many different ways can you deliver 120 packages? Okay. That's a big number. And we're asking people, right, with three pounds of fat in their head, right, and although the brain is energy efficient, it, it's, it's not that fast. So this guy has to basically decide on his route. And so what UPS did is they used the software to optimize the route. And just to give you an example, one of these was picked by a human and one of these was picked by the software. Anyone tell which one's which? Well, this is a human over here, actually, and this is the software over here. And you might think, well, big deal. I don't see much of a difference. But if you can cut the route time down by 10%, right? 10% less labor, 10% wear and tear on the truck, right? Customers get their packages earlier. This is worth millions and millions, even billions of dollars, okay? And so, you know, they, they, they use all sorts of sensors and telematics to not only optimize routes, but also to do things like, um, uh, you know, track all the packages. They know where all the packages are in real time. They know where all the trucks are in real time. Okay. They also know things about driver safety. So this is sort of how they can track whether the driver is using the seatbelt, where is the driver backing, right? Where is the engine idling? And then they can alter things in order to uh, give suggestions to the drivers or reduce fuel consumption, reduce accidents, and so forth. It's a very, very complicated computational task, and yet every single company is confronted with these sorts of tasks, okay? So I'm going to conclude with one last example. Let me just switch through this, all this stuff. I didn't know how much I would get to. I was going to see what the audience. This is, this is basically the, the, the takeaway that I think a lot of us have uh, uh, realized from understanding business today is that really every business is, is becoming a software business, okay? So let me just give you this last example. Um, to, and it, I think it captures a lot of what's happening in industry now. So you guys all know about General Electric. Now what, what business are they in? What business are they in? Uh, industrial this and engine that and you know, drill bits and MRIs. Okay, obviously you guys have not been paying attention for the last hour and 15 minutes, right? Because, right, what happened is Jeff Immelt a couple years ago, according to the legend, woke up and said, wow, like, we write more software than every company in the world, but nine, we are a software company. Okay, now here's how that happened. So they used to be in the business of selling aircraft engines, right? And this is a physical stuff. But they would bundle it with a service contract. And so they were responsible for maintaining the, the, the engines. So their biggest cost item was the maintenance of these engines. So they figured, well, how can we reduce the cost of maintenance? Half the time we send our people out, the engines are fine. Half the time we send our people out and the engines are about to fall apart and we wish we had gotten there earlier. So what can you do to optimize? This is a purely operations problem, right? Anybody who's in operations knows this is a pure operation problem. What should you do in order to make sure that the people, the service people show up at the right time? Put sensors in. So put hundreds of sensors in the aircraft engine. 
And that allows you to optimize maintenance. Cuts millions and millions of dollars of expenses out. Now, here's, if that was all they did, fine, great, fantastic, wonderful industrial company. Uh, but, and they would need a lot of software to optimize that, that sort of service schedule. But here's what was great and innovative about General Electric, is that the operations people are using all this data, right, to optimize uh, the maintenance schedule. But the marketing people said, well, now that we have all this data, what can we do? Now we know how every single customer is using our product. We know whether they're flying high altitude or low altitude. We know whether they're flying short routes or long routes. We know whether or not right, they're, they're flying in humid or low, high humidity, low humidity. Right? They're flying with lots of dust and desert. Whether they're flying through patches of pigeons right, or seagulls like in JFK. Right? We know all this stuff. So what can we do? Stop selling engines and start selling thrust. Right? So now we can provide right, a service instead of a product. Instead of a, instead of a thing, we're providing a service. That service is thrust. We sell you the ability to get your plane off the ground. And now we can price according to usage. Okay? And we can actually send in a monthly bill saying, hey, you know what? If you fly to Dubai less and fly over here more, then we can charge you less. So we can help you optimize your routing schedule. We can help you optimize your fuel economy. We can help you optimize your fleet allocation because we now have all this information. So people think of this as a manufacturing company. In fact, it's a service company. It's a soft, built around software and built around data acquisition. And this is the transformation that every single company is going through. Right? Some are going to succeed and some are going to fail. Okay? But if you don't have a data strategy, in your business, your business will fail. It's not enough to have data. Twitter has tons of data. Facebook has tons of data. Okay? But only one of them has a data strategy. And that's why one is succeeding and one is failing. So even in new age companies with lots of data, doesn't mean they always have a data strategy. Okay? So anyway, welcome back to Haas. It's great to see so many familiar faces. Enjoy the rest of your alumni weekend.